In this video, I'm going to talk about the character table for the C3V point group, which uh, the ammonia molecule, which is shown right here, is an example of a molecule with C3V point symmetry. And so the reason for doing this, even after already showing how to derive the the irreducible representations in the character table for C2V last time is that we will see in this one we will end up with something a little bit different and so that's kind of the main thrust of this video is to explain those things that are a little bit different. And so we start by getting our 3x3 matrix representations so we have our identity, we have our C3 and C3 squared matrices here, so those are the rotations. We have our three reflections here, which we can see up here. So we have this three-part rotation here where we, if we start, say, right here, we do C3, C3 squared, C3 to the third is just the identity. We have the sigma 1, the sigma 2, and the sigma three reflection planes right there. So the reflection planes would be kind of going in and out of the screen from there. And so that's what these matrices are representing. And so the first thing you probably notice is that these ones do in fact have off diagonal elements. And so that's kind of the main difference that we have going on here. So when we block diagonalize, we can't have one uh, we can't have three one by one matrices for each representation. We have a two by two irreducible representation and a one by one irreducible representation for each of them. And so we take the trace of the two by twos and just the one by ones by themselves are, you know, their own trace essentially. And so the trace of the identity element gives us a character of two. Uh, because that's just a 1 and a 1 in the diagonal there. <clears throat> the trace of the 2 by 2 rotations gives us minus 1, uh, since these have minus half and minus half in the diagonal elements of those 2 by 2 there. Uh, the trace of all the 1 by 1 matrices is 1. Uh, uh, and the trace of the 2 by 2 reflections here is 0, because we have minus and positive in each of those diagonal elements. So that gives us this character table here. And so a few things here. The first to notice is that we have this E here now uh, on the side. And so we should not mistake that for the identity element. And in fact, I've seen it in some place before where they actually put like a hat above that E to tell us that that one is an operation. So it's the identity operation where this one here is essentially just a name, a name for this irreducible representation that has twos in the identity column. <clears throat> and so that's what the E means that it has uh, two in the identity column, that it, it, it comes from two by two matrices. It's irreducible representations are two by two matrices. Uh, so that's the first thing to notice. Uh, so uh, the second thing is that uh, we have the chi of the C3 being equal to the character of the C3 squared. Then the character of each of these reflections is the same. And so, uh, so we can see that uh, for these, everything is the same. And for these, everything is the same. And so we can actually turn those into classes. And so this is kind of the next ch difference that we see uh, from our C2V last time is now we have these coefficients here in front of those because there are that many operations in those classes. So we only have three classes, but this class has two operations in it, and this class has three operations in it. Uh, so now we see, like I said, we have three classes, and therefore we need three irreducible representations. So you can see I put this A, B, and C in here. So to do that, we use our table properties. Uh, so the first one here, so we have the uh, 1 squared plus 2 times 1 squared uh, plus 3 times 1 squared. So we're squaring each of 
these things here and then multiplying by the coefficients, so the number of operations in that class, and that gives us six. Uh, if we do it for the E row here, we have two squared plus two times minus one squared, which just makes minus one and a positive one, and then three times zero squared. And so four times two is equal to six. Uh, so then we can use the orthogonality. So we first do it with the E representation here. So we uh, take each pairwise multiplication. So two times A, so that is these two numbers. Uh, then we have our coefficient out front, then negative one times B, so that is these ones, and then three times zero times C, so that is these ones right here. And so this one will cancel out. So we get 2A plus, and this will be minus 2B, which we can then add to both sides. So we get 2A equals 2B. So A is going to be equal to B. So we know we have A equal to B. So then we can do the same thing with our A1 representation now. So we multiply these two things together. We multiply these two things together right here, making sure to put that coefficient down there. Uh, and then we multiply these two things together with that three coefficient right here. And since we know that A equals B, we can just substitute an A in for that B. And so we have one times A plus two times A uh, plus three times C. So we have three A plus three C. Uh, so we just subtract three C from both sides divide through by three, and we have A equals minus C. And so we know that uh, we have A equals B equals one, and therefore C has to equal minus one. And so if we put that into this condition again, uh, we have the one squared plus two times one squared plus three times minus one squared, and that gives us six. And so we can generate this table then. So we have our three irreducible representations here, and now we have these bases here, which is uh, going to be what I talk about here, because uh, a few things to notice that are different on this, and well, probably the main thing to notice is that we have these things in parentheses here. And so that means those two things become dependent on each other. Uh, so if we do a rotation, they become uh, actually sort of negatively dependent on each other. Uh, but we see that they have this dependence on each other. And so once again, we're using the right hand coordinate system. If we're looking down, say, at our nitrogen or our ammonia here with our nitrogen in the middle, uh, we have X going out this way, Y going up that way, and then Z would be coming out of the screen. And so we can do some rotations here. Uh, and so a C3 rotation makes X and Y dependent on each other. Uh, and so we can see, for instance, in this left one here, uh, our X now has an X component and a Y component, and our Y has a Y component and now an X component. And so those two things are now dependent uh, on each other. Uh, those are, they're not completely independent of each other. We have a component uh, of X and Y for both of them. Uh, furthermore, we see that when X equals plus, then Y equals plus, and when X equals minus, then Y equals minus. Uh, and so rotations send both into the negative, uh, hence why the principal axis of rotation is minus one. Then uh, so we can think about this RX and RY, and so, uh, so I kind of thought of a better way of explaining this than I think I did in the previous video. And so the RX and RY rotations will be also be dependent on each other. So when the Y-axis is rotated by 120 degrees around the Z-axis, a rotation around the Y-axis will now have some component in the X direction. And so we can think about that if we have a rotation around the Y-axis by an amount theta times this sort of uh, Y basis here. So, so a Y basis kind of pointing in the same direction as the Y axis. So that any rotation about our three axes 
uh, in general can be represented by a linear combination of these uh, of these rotations around each axis. And so that would be something like this over here, where a rotation around the x-axis is the the she here times our sort of x component or x basis rather then around the y would be sort of a theta around the y basis and then the z would be a phi around the z basis like that and so if we have a uh, a vector that's pointing only in the y direction say we're only doing a a rotation around the y then we would have some some vector that sort of points in this direction where its magnitude uh, is telling us sort of how much we are actually rotating it. So its magnitude is uh, essentially the amount that we are rotating it and the direction it's pointing tells us sort of which direction we're rotating. So it points positive if we are rotating in this direction. If we rotated in the other direction then we would have something that points in the negative like that. Now let's say for now we have something pointing in the positive direction. And so then if we take this vector here, so this vector that we have uh, right here telling us about a pure rotation in the y direction, so we'll call that vector v like that. And so if we do a rotation around the z axis, so uh, say over here, Oops, say over here we're doing some rotation around the z-axis of this sort of purely y right here. Then we do this z rotation matrix right here. Uh, and so these should be zero on here since we're saying that it's a purely y rotation. Uh, so now we do we now rotate that vector around the z this way so maybe it uh so maybe 120 degrees so that it's now pointing in that direction well now we see that there is uh some uh so if this is our minus x here we have some minus x component and uh if this is our minus y here we have some minus y component there and so that tells us that this rotation around this axis now, around this axis here, and so uh, it would be a rotation around that way, uh, which we see is sort of the opposite way that this one is rotating, which is why it's pointing in the negative, uh, now has an x and y component there. Uh, and so that is why uh, this is negative on here because it sends it into the negative. It sort of reverses the actual rotation around it on there. So it is negative. All right, and so then if we want to talk about these reflections, so we see for the reflections we actually have a zero here for our x and y and for our rotations around x and y. Uh, and so what's happening, so if we just look at sort of rotations, uh, so if we look at uh, just uh, the reflections across, the, uh, across these, what we see is that, so we have these reflection matrices here. So these reflection matrices. If we look at just the the uh, the two by two part here, and we act it on our sort of x and y bases, we see this has a positive and a negative. This is a negative and a negative. This has a positive and a positive. This is a positive and a negative. This has a negative and zero. This has a zero and negative. And so there's really no sort of correlation between the x and y that is common between all the reflections. And so that's why we have a zero in that column. Uh, and so, uh, so we have these x squared plus y squared and the x squared minus y squared and xy here. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually going to, I might describe those in a different video. I do have notes written up for it and I'll 
I'll put a link to those if you want to look at that, that on your own. But, uh, you know, so the thing to notice, I guess, is uh, the, the D orbitals. If you ever look at D orbitals, so kind of looking at the chemistry again, you'll know that D orbitals have, have things like the D, like the DXY and the DXZ and the DYZ and the D, uh, the DZ squared and the D, uh, I think it's X squared. Yeah, it should be X squared minus Y squared. You'll see that these things all sort of uh, correspond to each of those D orbitals, uh, which look something like, so if we have our coordinate axes here, then uh, say this is Y and this is X, then a D orbital looks something like, like this. Um, try to draw them all about the same size, where this part here is positive, this part's negative, this part's positive, and this part's negative as far as the wave function goes. And so when we sort of uh, rotate these by uh, 180 degrees, so if we rotate these by, or by 120 degrees rather, uh, which is what we have here for the C3, uh, you can see that this will get rotated to, you know, somewhere right there, that to somewhere right there, that to somewhere right there, and that to somewhere right there. And so uh, the positives and negatives all somewhat change places. And so that's why we have this uh, minus one here, and that would be uh, our x, y right here. And of course, if we have, if we're looking at this x and z, we see uh, if this is our z here and this is our x, uh, we would have something that looks like this as well, uh, where this is positive, negative, positive, negative. And so if we did a rotation around the z axis, we see that this positive uh, would end up kind of over here. Uh, because we're sort of rotating around that way. Uh, and so we would end up with this X sort of uh, over in this, you know, octant, I guess, of the cube, uh, because really we're thinking about, you know, something that would look like this. So we have our Y, X, and Z. And so something sort of up in this uh, sort of part, uh, I guess, octant of the cube would end up over here. But, but anyway, uh, I don't want to ramble on about this too much. I hope that makes some sense. I hope this uh, explanation about uh, what happens to the rotations uh, after we do a rotation. So, what happens to the uh, rotation about the the x and y axes, for instance, after doing a rotation about the z and things like that. I hope this explanation was maybe a little clearer than in my previous video. Uh, but anyway, I hope you found this video helpful, and I will see you in the next one.